In today's episode, we're going to be checking out the Paul Reed Smith SE594. Now, if you saw my review of the DGT SE, um, uh, you'll understand where a lot of this kind of new attitude with PRS is coming from. But if you haven't, you can check out the link down below and watch that video. What you can see is PRS is stepping up the evolution of these guitars. Everything from the Silver Sky SE to the new SE 2408s to the SE DGT and now of course the SE 594. What you're seeing is Paul Reed Smith guitars basically taking the SE line and making it shockingly close. In fact, I would say it's almost exactly like the S2, almost in every way, and then very close to the core. So let me explain why I'm saying that. Let's go over the specifications. We have a mahogany body. This is probably a three-piece body. I can't see because the back is like a black, dark brown black, but I'm uh, guessing it's three pieces. I've seen other models like this. They were three pieces. The neck is three pieces. There is no scarf joint. Then you have a Cluson style tuning keys. That's to make it like the uh, 594 core guitar. So you know, these are great. However, you can upgrade these to Godo or Cluson locking keys. they are direct replacements that'll pop in and I'll put links to those down below in case you want this and you wanna go locking. It really speeds up the uh, restringing process. This is not only just a graphite nut, this is the same bronze graphite nut that you would see on the core line of guitars. Now, some of the cores use bone and some of them use the bronze graphite, but this this nut is the same as a PRS core guitar. You have binding on the neck, a rosewood fretboard with 22 medium jumbo frets, and they seem to be highly polished and detailed. We'll go over those in the geeky stuff. Now, this is a true maple cap. It's a quarter inch maple cap, you can see right here. And then you have a veneer of flame maple wood. You have the vintage pattern neck. This neck is the exact same neck as what you would find on the cores and the S2s minus the 594 thin, that has a pattern thin neck. And these necks feel almost exactly the same to me. And of course, this is called the 594 because it is 24.594 inch scale length. So basically 24 and a half, basically. Uh, so a little shorter than a Gibson Les Paul. And that's really where we need to talk about this for a second. There's a magic to this guitar. It's why it's becoming PRS's top selling guitar. This and the Silver Sky are some of the best selling PRSs they've ever done, even though they've had the lineage of the 24, custom 24s and stuff. And one of the reasons is, is because this neck is very big. It's very chunky, like um, a 59 Les Paul. However, because of this 24, basically and a half, 24.594 inch scale length, it's so easy to bend the strings. That is what this does beautifully. That scale length with this neck, is kind of magical, especially if you've ever played any of the 59 Les Paul reissues, you know that there are some things that are cool about them. This kind of hits that spot. It gives you a little bit of that magic uh, of that, you know, that time and that way the guitars were created. But of course, it's a little bit modernized. So it's a little bit of nice things, a little bit of the past, a little bit of the present put together. We have two volumes and two tones and they are coil splittable. We'll go through those, of course, in the geeky stuff and go through all that. The pickup rings, are not the same as the cores. In other words, the, uh, the screws are not recessed and they're not rounded like the cores. However, they are the right color. They are ivory instead of the yellowed uh, look that you saw a lot of times on the SEs. So this is again, something that really pops. And then the guitar also includes a deluxe gig bag with a lot of features, including the fact it has a pouch in the front that will hold uh, your picks. There's a little small zipper pocket for your picks some spots for some pens and pencils, and of course a bigger pocket if you wanna put some paperwork in there. And of course there's a hanging, I like to show this in every video. There's a hook here so you can hang it in your closet or behind a door to get it out of the way. And includes a gel pack to keep the case dry. A truss rod adjustment tool. This is a dual action truss rod. The last thing to point out is this guitar is polyurethane. So it's a polyurethane finish. And on that note, we should check it out in the geeky stuff. Okay, so now it's time for the geeky stuff. Let's start with the headstock. And we have the Paul Reed Smith SE logo and the McCarty 594 covered on the truss rod. Looking at the back of the headstock, you can see that they put that it's made in Indonesia by Quartet Guitars for PRS. A nice little tidbit here. Look at this. Look how they did this, the binding, and then the binding went underneath like that. I don't know if that's just this guitar or if it's going to be all the models, but it looks great. And look how tight and clean that looks. 
Now looking at the nut, it looks fantastic. We're gonna go ahead and test it. And we see they left just a little bit of space. And again, that seems to be standard. And I think it's because they don't wanna cut them too low because then you'll be stuck with a problem if you have any issues. You can check this by pushing down on the third fret and playing with how much play is there. And what's funny is this is dead on exactly to the other PRSs I've done. So these PRS SEs are so consistent, it almost feels like I'm reviewing the same guitar over and over again. So sure, you might get inconsistent models when you order one. However, man, they're coming in really consistent. Okay, checking the relief on this guitar, there was just a little bit of relief. And like I said, that's fine. So let's go ahead and check the action. And we are sitting at two millimeters, which seems to be pretty standard. And we go and cross each string. Two millimeters, which is very standard for the guitars shipped to us. In fact, it's the most common setup that we see on the channel when guitars are shipped from the factory to us or from the dealers to us. And by the way, for the reference of that, it's two millimeters or 0 0.08. So there you go. So let's go ahead and check the frets. We'll use the fret rocker here. Now, one thing that's great is if you remember the 80s, Ibanez and guitar companies like Jackson and stuff were known for just amazing fret work. And PRS has definitely continued that tradition. And it's nice that they really kind of want that to be the standard for the SEs. If you're looking at an SE, that's one thing I think you could, is good quality frets. All right, now it's time for the fret end test. So let's go ahead and check the frets. And I can feel it, you can hear it snagging. Can feel it snagging. This one, what's really weird is I thought the frets felt really good, but you can see they were pretty heavy on the snagging. This is definitely a three out of five. Obviously snags the nylon, but doesn't wouldn't snag your hand. Okay, so now it's time to check the base side. And very the same. It's very much the same. Yep, they look pretty consistent. So again, three out of five, uh, without a doubt. One of the lowest, I think, SEs I've seen on the sock test, but it's still passing grade. Three is, is passing. Now let's check to see how polished the frets are. And if you watch this, uh, any of these in the series, you know some of these guitars, when we move the string, it sounds like we're, we're just going on sandpaper. Sometimes you can't hear anything at all. So let's just randomly find some spots. And they feel pretty good. These don't feel as polished as the Dave Grissom DGT SE I just did, but they are really good. Nothing to complain about. Um, again, like I said, they don't feel like a luthier or a tech has used like a polishing Dremel tool or anything like that to really highly polish them, but they feel polished, good enough to play. I mean, definitely so far out of the box, this guitar is ready to play. And of course, this is a Paul Reed Smith. So we have the 10 inch radius fretboard, which is what they use. Checking the neck thickness, we are at 43.30 millimeters or 1.704. And the 12th fret is at 2.097, so over two inches or 53.27 millimeters. And the thickness at the first fret is 22.26 millimeters or 0 0.8. And the thickness at the 12th fret is 0 0.9 or 25.11 millimeters. A lot of you are probably gonna be curious about the neck carve. And like I said, if you've played the S2 or the Core, I think the neck is gonna feel very familiar to you. If it's different, it's just slightly different in the way it feels. However, if you watch the Dave Grissom DGT SE I did, you notice in that video, I decided that it was really close to the 1954 Les Paul profile. This guitar is totally opposite. Look at this. We go here. I mean, you can see right there, it's not even close. And uh, go here. Same thing, it's not even close. So let's use the 59 Les Paul and you can see it's still not there, but it's a lot closer, definitely a lot closer. But at the 11th fret, it's really close. So again, it's got the 59 Les Paul vibe, but I think it actually feels a little bit more comfortable to the hand. I have a Gibson R9 and I have to say this neck is more comfortable than my R9 to me. Weighing the guitar, this comes in at 6.9 pounds. That's super light. And uh, I've seen two other SE594s and they were super light as well. Another upgrade to this guitar is putting the exact same style of bridge that you see on the core. And of course the S2, what you have is an aluminum ultra light tailpiece with brass studs. The bridge has brass saddles with brass adjusters. One of the questions you guys might have is how are they mounting the bridge to the body? And you can see right here, there is inserts right here. So this is the stud for the tailpiece. And that fits really nice. Not a lot of wiggle in there, very, very nice. And this is the bridge right here. And you can see there's an insert here. Um, I know some of you probably were thinking that they probably were kind of direct mounting it into the wood like Gibson does. 
um, but it obviously seems to be a threaded insert and again, very stable. So they are mounted into inserts. Something to note, the back plates sit on top of the body. That's something we've talked about in a couple of these videos. Some of you guys say it matters, some of you guys say it don't. Something to point out on this one though, is that this plate, this screw is a little stripped out. So one thing I want to show you is when you do have a hole for a pick guard or a back plate that's stripped out and then you can tell because the screw just isn't tightening anymore. There's a way to fix that. Obviously you just use a toothpick. Now the important part is clip the end off, use the flat inside, not the pointy side of a toothpick and it's going to go right in there. However, this is the way I do it. So what I do is I use some tight bond. Go ahead and give it a real good amount of, and let it sit. I let it sit for about one to two minutes just to let the uh, wood get soft. Just go ahead and rotate it. That's the perfect amount right there. Stick it in the hole like that. And then what I do is I go to cut it and I lift up just a little bit. And there you go. And before it dries, I use a stick pin like this, carefully. Find the center of the toothpick and push down. It just helps the screw go in perfectly. So now we're gonna put the plate on and now you'll notice you'll be able to set the screw in perfectly like this. And it's very snug. Okay, let's look at these electronics. We see that the pickups are made exactly like the core guitars where we have the three conductor wire. We have the, the hot, the ground, of course, is the wrap around it. And then this white wire that's going to these switches is the coil split. Somebody asked about this last time what these resistors are. Another improvement to the SEs is how they're new, how they're wiring the uh, resistors in their coil splits. They were doing it a different way. They were doing it a more generic way than the core guitars. And now this looks like it's done pretty much exactly like the core guitars. So what you see here, if you see these resistors right here, you have two resistors, one on each tone pot or push pull. One is a 2.2K for the bridge and one is a 1.1K for the neck. What I want to do is show you how Paul Reed Smith is coil splitting their pickups that is slightly different. Normally, you'll have four wires, but on Paul Reed Smith's pickups, we're going to say there's three because there is. You're going to essentially have a, a wire that goes to ground right here. And then, of course, you'll have the lead wire and that'll go off to, let's say, the switch or the potentiometer. And there's a third wire. And what that will go to is a switch. Now, whether that's a push pull or a switch, I know this isn't the official diagram for switch. I just want you to see it's a switch. So what happens is you throw the switch. This switch is wired to ground. And then what you do is you have the third wire, it's this terminal. And essentially, if we throw the switch and it goes to ground, we essentially remove one coil. Now, obviously they're physically both there, but you only get a single coil now. You get only one of the coils. That's what's happening. You're just routing that coil to ground. This is not the right resistor. I just need one for illustration purposes. What they're doing is essentially connecting a resistor like so in line, or to be honest, they're just tapping it over to ground. And what they're doing is, because this resistor is in place, when you hit the switch to send this to ground, it doesn't allow 100% of that pickup to go to ground, which means that pickup is not really removed in a traditional coil split way. What PRS is essentially doing is weakening one of these coils so that one is more dominant and therefore, you get a fuller sound. So that's why they're doing it. Now, interesting on this model versus the DGT, the DGT had treble bleeds. This does not have any treble bleeds. This is just a 500K alpha pot and then the 500K potentiometer push pulls with 0.22 microfarad capacitors right there. This is shielded. So this is shielding paint and it is shielded and the back plate is not shielded. And we have the output jack with a football style plate, which I like because it's metal instead of plastic. And of course, we have the 5815S pickups. Now, the S is, of course, means they're imported and we'll check those. So let's go ahead and check these pickups out. We're sitting at the bridge and we see it at 7.6K, which is a very low output pickup, something like a PAF territory. And then we have the neck pickup and that's sitting at 7.1. And then we show the bridge pickup inductance at... 4.25 and the neck pickup at 4.08. So again, these pickups are gonna feel and sound probably close to the original pickups. 
Let's take a look at the market comparables because they're pretty crazy. This SE costs $949 with the included gig bag. However, the Paul Reed Smith S2 version of this guitar that is made in Stevensville, Maryland costs double the price. Comes with the same type of gig bag. It's cosmetically different, but quality wise about the same and has the same exact pickups, bridge and very similar construction. However, it has improved locking tuning keys. And of course, there's a few other small details that are different. Now compared to the core, which is four times times the price of the SE and double the price of the S2. Of course, comes with upgraded made in USA pickups, a hard shell case, and a lot more involved carves and cuts on the guitar with some obviously improvements to some of the quality components as well. But just to give you an idea, this guitar looks like the best deal of the bunch to the point that I don't even want to say what I'm thinking yet until my final thoughts. All right, so now it's time to check out the guitar and to see how it sounds. We're going to start with the neck pickup because we're on the clean. We're running a Fender 65 Deluxe Reverb with a stock Jensen with an SM57 and it's going to sound like this. What's really nice, that scale length. Those bends are pretty nice. <laughs> and then with the bigger neck, it's, it's harder to kind of dig in, which is good, because otherwise you'd be just exaggerated. One of the things I really like about dual coil splits is that you can coil split the neck pickup only. I'm not a big uh, user of the coil split bridge pickup. So I'll leave this up. And so I'm in the bridge. And if I want to go to the neck, I'm already in single coil mode because I've left it up. Okay, so now that's our neck pickup. Let's go to our bridge. Middle position. And it's gonna be the blend of those two pickups, of course. Of course, think about this. You can coil split one of these pickups. So now we have a humbucker and a coil split pickup. Both coil split. Humbucker single. Dual humbuckers. So again, a lot of tones. I mean, obviously you'll be able to pull anything out of this guitar and that's kind of like its purpose. It's to be, like I said, a more vintage kind of vibed instrument with some modern features. Let's go ahead and use some overdrives. So for today's overdrives, we're gonna be using the Bad Cat Black Cat and running it through a V30 with an SM57. And we're gonna start on the neck pickup, which is a little different for us, but I just really love this guitar in the neck pickup. <laughs> Vibrato is just effortless. And these are 10 to 46s. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, we have to go to the bridge now. Okay, so here's the bridge. <laughs> All right, so we gotta be fair and try the single coil tones. Here's the single coil neck pickup. All right, and lastly, what we'll do is the uh, single coil bridge pickup. That's cool, it's really... Maybe it's the scale and that pickup in work. It's almost like it feels like I'm playing on a rubber band. So what are my final thoughts now that I've finished the video? Well, I played this guitar for a few weeks and I have to say, it just kept impressing me more and more. Uh, I, I really like taking the time to do these long you know, form videos that I do because I don't think when you first get the guitar or when you first start playing the guitar, you really can comprehend all the things that they've upgraded on this SE line. And over the period of a couple weeks, really just going through it, I even come back in this video two or three times just because there's so many elements that they've upgraded to the point where I don't know why the S2 is gonna exist. And as you know, I'm a huge fan of the S2. I think the 594 core is a, is a work of art. It's a collector's piece, it's a beautiful instrument, and anyone would be very lucky to own such a great guitar. The S2 version 594 to me is more of a working product. In other words, you take it, you use it, you play it, you abuse it. I mean, obviously you could feel that way about all these levels, but I think the average player out there isn't really gonna be really, you know, really crazy to throw around their $4,000 guitar. However, this new SE creates a new opportunity, which is this guitar versus the S2 is really, I think, the fight to, to have. And I didn't mention it, I'm sorry, I apologize when I was mentioning the differences. The S2 is now nitro lacquer uh, on the 594, where this is a polyurethane. SE. But I think if you gave me the choice out of the two, the SE or the S2, I think I still like the S2 just a little bit more. But I don't know how to really rationalize that to you in a double the cost, you know, logic. I can't tell you it's double the guitar. It's just not. But I, there's just something I like about it. However, this is the important thing. I think SEs, like a lot of import guitar versions of their expensive US counterparts, have always been like a taste of the guitar. It's like, this is a little like the real thing enough. This is so much like the thing, the, the real thing, that I think there's not a whole lot to miss here. And so it's definitely worth checking out. If you're curious about how it compares to the DGT SE, you can check out that video down below, like I said, and watch both videos and come to the conclusion yourself. That's why I do such details in the videos is so that you can consider and weigh all your own options if you're considering these guitars. As always, I wanna thank all of you for hanging out today. And until the next time, know your gear. Now just remember, the builders who send these guitars for my review have a drive to make great guitars. They agree to send non-cherry picked instruments and let me try to find the best and the worst points of their guitar. Nothing I say or show is meant to take away from their hard work, dedication, and I applaud their ability to check their egos at the door and share their workmanship with us. Let's face it, most companies are not willing to do this.